Agency's Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps you deliver beautiful proposals in the cloud and close more deals. Welcome to the 38th episode of Agency's Drinking Beer. Today we're talking to Mary Nichols, Account Director at Murmur Creative in Portland, Oregon. Hey, Jen. How you doing? Hey, Kevin. How are you? <laughs> Pe- uh, people are... Kyle's not here, everybody. No. Well, yep. We we ousted him. There was a hostile takeover of Proposify. We kicked the co-founder yep. to the curb. He put his resume into bid sketch, so <laughs> here we go. <laughs> if we were like a publicly traded company, our stocks, something mad would be happening yeah. with our stocks right now. People would be like running for the roof. We'd be on CNN. Like that. That's it. On this is business. how we yes. should get these rumors started. Yes. No, actually, Kyle's just super sick. Yeah, he's got bronchitis. He's not good. So uh, it's me, Jennifer, here, standing in, mm. and Kevin. Doing a mighty fine job, I might say. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I might. I might just take over forever. But yeah, Kyle's not feeling well. So uh, we did this interview with the awesome Mary Nichols, who you're going to hear about. And uh, she has got fantastic enthusiasm. Mm. And it's an excellent interview, a lot of great content. So I think we should probably just get right into this one. What do you think? Yeah, who wants to listen to us? Blah, 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 (laughs) not me. Let's go. Let's hear it from Mary. From Mary Nichols. So today we're talking with Mary Nichols, who's the account director at Murmur Creative in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, and uh, just recapping with our listeners who are wondering what happened to Kyle's voice, Kevin is here, but uh, Kyle is off sick with the plague. So mm. it's me, Jennifer <laughs> Faulkner, marketing manager here at Proposify. So, but I was also excited to be able to interview Mary, but we were not going to let Kyle near this building with a 10 foot pole. Ky- Kevin, you already saw him today, right? Oh my God. I said, dude, stay home. I saw him. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I blame children. Yes. <laughs> little Petri dishes with legs and arms. So uh, one of the things we love about agencies drinking beer is we take it quite literally. We like to have our guests drink a beer while we interview. And the thing about Mary, well, right now it's 1 o'clock here in Halifax. It is what time there, Mary? In it's Portland? 9 a.m. in Portland. And Mary, do you have a beer? Oh, I certainly <laughs> do. What are you drinking? (laughs) Well, I don't know if you know this about Portland, Oregon, um, but we are kind of the brewery capital of the world. We have over 65 breweries um, just in Portland. And there's, we're getting close to 250 in the state of Oregon. So we take our craft beer very seriously. So I put a lot of thought into what beer I was going to be drinking today. So I decided to go with a gigantic IPA, Um, and gigantic is within walking distance to my house. And if you live in Portland, you're pretty much always within walking distance of a brewery. (laughs) Wow, Um, dream. Yeah, and the great thing about this is they only sell their beer in 22-ounce bottles. (laughs) So, Hence so it's literally gigantic. Gi- yeah. Yeah, gigantic. Yeah. I so, didn't know if it was a small G <laughs> or a big G, but it sounds like both. Oh, yeah. I'm drinking a gigantic beer in many ways at 9 a.m. this morning. Breakfast of champions. You're my hero. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I actually, I really love beer. Um, and I think that I used to work at the Coors Brewing Company. And I did the marketing for Coors Light and Keystone Light. And when I worked there, and as we talk, you'll find this out about me, but I, when I'm in, I'm all in and Mm -hmm. I'm an incredibly loyal person. So I wanted to know everything there was to know about beer. So I signed up to be a beer taster when I was at Coors. (laughs) So every day 
at noon, I would walk over to the brewery and I'd go up and I'd sit in front of these windows that were black and they'd open and someone would put four different beers in front of me and close the screen. And then I would drink the beers and rate them on all of these different taste attributes. And I did this every single day (laughs) for almost three years. Hey, Mary, excuse me. Are they hiring right now? (laughs) (laughs) And was this before you had kids or? or? This was before I had kids. (laughs) Yes. And, you know, granted, you're not drinking four entire beers. Um, You're tasting beers. But I did notice at about two o'clock. I really needed a nap yeah. <laughs> every day. <laughs> so I do really appreciate beer. So I was very excited. Um, any excuse to drink a good IPA at nine in the morning. Well, yeah. Kevin and I are uh, representing local. So actually here in Halifax in the last number of years, we've developed quite a microbrew culture. And uh, it seems like we were just saying in the office the other day, it seems like every week you hear about a new little microbrewery mm. coming up out of the crack. Mm-hmm. So I'm drinking a ghost face killer. Uh, I love the name, uh, which is from Good Robot Brewery, which uh, is a new little brewery just a couple blocks from my house. And I tried it for the first time last week, and I loved it. So, uh, And plus, I love that uh, the name is after a rapper, which is about as cool as I get. I don't really know much about the rapper, but I I love that (laughs) that the beer is named after it. So it's tasty. And what are you drinking, Kevin? Well, kind of, um, I decided to go traditional. I'm drinking uh, Alexander Keith's IPA, which uh, you would know more about this being from your gen, but Alexander Keith is a very famous man from Halifax. And this is kind of, I hate to use this, but it's kind of the Budweiser of Nova Scotia. It's very popular mainstream, but yet it is way better than Budweiser. It's an IPA. Oh. And um, it's, you know, it's orig- actually when I first moved here, I think you could only get it here, but now they export Yeah, for it. a long time. Yeah. Because uh, when my brother and I lived in other parts of Canada, my little mom would uh, fly on the plane. One bag would have lobster. And one bag would have tall tins of Alexander Keith beer for us. <laughs> she was so awesome. So she she would smuggle beer and lobster across any border. True maritime, <laughs> right there. To us, so so that's great. Uh, so Mary, um, one of the things when we were talking back and forth that I thought was super uh, interesting. Well, and first of all, uh, to just kind of be totally candid, and also I want to prove to everybody that when we ask for guests and say, email us, and we'd love to put you on the show, that's exactly what Mary did. Well, and she flattered <laughs> us. And she flattered us. And that was <laughs> Flattery works with us, because she is a Proposify customer, and uh, well, first she flattered me on my blog post, then she flattered us on Proposify, then she said, I'd love to, you know, if you want a guest on a podcast, so I was like, of course, that's, that's <laughs> the, the way they're hard, so, so dear listeners, email us, tell us something flatterily, <laughs> and uh, we'll put you on the show. Nice. <laughs> Uh, But one of the things uh, when we were going back and forth with Mary, and I thought, Mary, you could just talk a little bit um, about how you got into marketing, because you have a very interesting childhood connection to marketing that pretty much, I think, sealed your your destiny, would you say? Yeah, it it really did. Um, So I grew up in a suburb of Chicago, Illinois, and my dad was the general counsel of Leo Burnett Advertising which up to mm, probably about 15 years ago was the largest privately held ad agency in the world. Um, And then they were bought by Publicis. So he was there for um, about 30 years. And he really instilled uh, some, you know, beliefs in the entire family um, through how he went through his day And he really believed in loyalty to his clients. And we were actually never allowed to go eat at Burger King. We could only eat McDonald's because (laughs) that was their client. I never had Cheerios because it wasn't a Keebler product. I could have Fruit Loops. I could have, 
frosted flakes. <laughs> you got the good that, stuff. Of, yeah. Oh, <laughs> those yeah. Keebler elves, those Keebler elves used to freak me out, though. Oh, definitely. And the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I love that guy. <laughs> yeah, they, they created a, a lot of really great characters. That's kind mm. of what they were known for. Um, my dad drove an Oldsmobile. We only drove Oldsmobiles. And he would always say, you know, these are our clients and they're uh, helping me buy this house and feeding you and they're going to help put you through college. So we have to be loyal to them no matter what. So this is how we're going to live. So I even remember being a little kid and he brought me this home one night. This, um, Do you remember the Jolly Green Giant? Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. And so he had this jolly green giant kite that he gave me and i brought it outside um, that weekend and i was in a big field it was in the summer and it was just this little plastic kite it had the jolly green giant was just huge up in the sky and it had this little parachute that you could attach at the bottom and it would go all the way up to the top and it was sprout <laughs> if you remember wow. sprout was like jolly green giant's kid and I was laying in the um, the field watching like little sprout come down from the jolly green giant. And I mean, I really had no choice. I mean, I was just going <laughs> to be so- advertising <laughs> no matter what. Um, and so he used to bring me to work all the time with him. I would beg him to go to work with him. And so every chance I got, we would jump on the train. We'd go downtown And it truly, that office was exactly like the set of Mad Men. Wow. And my dad definitely was a little Don (laughs) Draper-ish. Not not quite as flawed. Is he listening right now? (laughs) (laughs) Not quite as flawed, that's for sure. And I was a little bit like Sally, but much better, of course. (laughs) Um, And I I would just run through the halls of that agency Uh, I used to be able to sit on um, pitch sessions with the creatives who would just pull me in the room and, you know, maybe they would be pitching star kiss tuna and they would practice and I'd be in the room. So I just kind of grew up with these iconic brands and this fierce loyalty um, that is built inside of me. And that's one of the reasons um, that I contacted you because I work at Murmur Creative um, in Portland. We're a creative agency. And we started using Proposify a few months ago. And it really was a game changer for us. Uh, I mean, we were spending a minimum of an hour on a proposal. And we would have to, we, we were doing like two week turnaround sometimes mm-hmm. and we discovered Proposify and it was like the clouds parted, the sun started shining and I realized I could get my life back and, and do what I'm really good at and, you know, focus on growing the business and getting new clients and developing strategies for clients And when you have me, when you've won me over, I am fiercely loyal. And so, for so I emailed you. And and the other thing that I want to say, and I know you don't talk about Proposify a lot on your podcasts, but today we're going to because I am such a fan. (laughs) Please go on. (laughs) Yeah. So um, anyway, filled with joy right now. And we're agency people too, so we get we get that pain point. Believe me. Oh yeah, yeah. It it was really bad. Uh, but the thing, one of the things that really impressed me is I, you know, I have had a few struggles with Proposify here and there, as I have with really any editor that you use on the internet, Word, Google Docs. You know, there's just some wonky things occasionally, mm. and I send you guys an email, and seventy five percent of the time it would come from Kyle. I'd go, Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Like the CEO is, was that really him emailing me? (laughs) It really was. (laughs) And I thought, wow, that's super cool. I loved that. That like kind of built my loyalty again, right there. So then I started stalking your company and following you on everything because that's what I do. 
And I recently saw someone on your Facebook page. Um, I know you, you told gave me. a really bad review. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. I, I saw you were like the kid in the playground. You went and stood up for us, which I really appreciate. That was awesome. Oh, I certainly did. I mean, it was like he was, you know, calling my baby ugly. <laughs> and so I got on there. And the thing about that review um, is, you know, the person had said he'd, you know, hit his head against a wall for four hours and was just over it and was just having so many problems. My feeling is like, I wouldn't spend four hours doing anything that was that frustrating. I'm just like, can't figure it out. I'm shooting off an email. They always get right back to me. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll go out there. I'll put myself out on a limb. So I'm kind of the person um, that I think that most companies really want to have. You know, everyone is going for that crazy, fanatical fan Mm -hmm. who will spread the word, who will beat the drum, you know, their, their mantra is like, Oh my gosh, you've got to, I mean, I've probably just word of mouth told 20 people about Proposify. Can you so take think, a picture you know, of that Proposify uh, tattoo you have on your arm? Could you send it to us? <laughs> so put that on? <laughs> no, but I did, I did hear on a, a, a podcast that you guys have t-shirts and I think I deserve a t-shirt at this you're point. You're getting a t-shirt. After sure. that Facebook fight, I, I went through. Yeah, you, you, you're, you're getting it. That for sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that's it. I mean, uh, not to talk too much about Proposify to your point, but um, you know, we know our baby acts up sometimes. I guess in this yeah. um, but but it's really valuable to to us to have people tell us when it's acting up because sometimes we just don't know, and we do try and um, jump on it as quickly as possible. But we get that it, when you're in the middle of the throes of a proposal and there's a deadline. And, you're you're just losing your mind, but um, it is true. Even in the evening, somebody is usually looking at the support queue, and and if it's emergency, we try and do something about it right away. One thing I want to say too is you touched on is the uh, the issues with a lot of editors, and when we had the agency, I wanted there to be a tool that we could use. We at the time didn't want to build something. You know, we I was using Adobe InDesign. I was doing the majority of proposals, and and like yourself, it was just uh, just oh. It just sucks the life right out of you, you know, and, and uh, it got to the point where, you know, we looked at some other of our, our competitors and you couldn't even drag a text box. The challenge is we didn't realize how friggin' hard it was going to be to build uh, a, a, an editor in the browser. Now we know why, like, a, you know, uh, Google Docs has probably 200 engineers working full time on it and there were three <laughs> of us at the beginning. So it took us quite some time even just to get to product market fit. But uh, so I definitely appreciate what you're saying there, too. It definitely uh, it's it's an ongoing um, battle in a sense. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, it's also I mean, you guys are a startup and you're listening and you want to improve and make things better. I'm just one for, you know, supporting startups, like not necessarily doing a bad review in public, like contacting the company directly, helping them get better. I just that's kind of, that's kind of my philosophy in life in general is just, you know, sticking together and helping each other succeed and not tearing each other down. And, um, just kind of a, a mantra I have in my life in general. Love it. I, agreed. Cause I, I often feel like a, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? Like it certainly it, does. if people just add a little please and thank you we are we're on it anyway but that just will will throw in a little something extra usually but so speaking of being a uh, a big fan why don't you tell us a little bit about murmur creative and what you do there okay so uh, murmur creative we're a creative agency and we have a focus on branding web design and digital marketing So I am the account director, which means I am in charge of all new business. Um, So anyone who ends up working with Murmur um, kind of meets me first, um, which is why the proposals are so important to me. Mm -hmm. We have three really talented designers and three amazing um, developers. Uh, And uh, we have one project manager And our owner is a creative director Mm -hmm. of the agency. And then we have a digital strategist. um, And he focuses on SEO and PPC um, and does a lot of copywriting for the web as well. 
So, and then we also have um, one of our developers who's in Boulder, Colorado, who lived in Portland and he's going to be coming back to Portland. So we are a team of 10 and we have experienced, we've almost doubled in size in the past year um, with number of people at the agency as well as our space. So we just moved in about a year ago to a place in Southeast Portland called Washington High School. And it's a hundred year old high school that had been vacant for um, the past 20 years. And a couple of people, developers, um, came together and they wanted to maintain you know, the integrity of the building, but turn it into creative space. And so the whole building is all of these offices for different creative businesses, a few mm-hmm. agencies. And in the middle of it, in the school auditorium, um, is a music venue called Revolution Hall. And it seats over 800 people. And it is an incredible music venue. And our studio is right outside the doors to this you know, music hall. So wow. we are in a really amazing spot. And when people come to our new office, it's the kind of huge eyes and just has this really great vibe. Our office isn't anything enormous or fancy, but we're in classrooms. You know, like pe- we had some people... <laughs> They're like, you know, very old come to our studio and like, oh my gosh, I was in chemistry class <laughs> here, you know, 80 years ago. Or <laughs> so we've, we've had a, a lot of fun moving into the space, but we've also grown our staff, which has had a few challenges, but all in all, things are going really well and we're just loving life. We're kind of living the dream in Portland right now. I, I I love hearing stories about people who love their agency job and okay. uh, love working because, um, you know, there are a lot of other stories and agency life, like a lot of people's work lives, can uh, be overwhelming and stressful and all that kind of stuff. And I think it, unfortunately, that has uh, sucked some of the great fun. I, I loved working in agencies and um, it, 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 it takes a lot of the the good away from it but it sounds like you guys have uh, found that that sweet spot in terms of culture and work life you know we really have and i credit you know most of that to our owner andrew who's our creative director he has just done a great job at hiring really good people that fit in well with the agency and we all really like each other um we all really respect each other uh, he's hired some very talented people. And um, the other thing about him is he is a huge advocate of work-life balance. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, when I was at Coors, I was putting in easily, you know, 60, sometimes 70 hour weeks, just working all the time. Like I know it happens at a lot of agencies and that doesn't happen at Murmur. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's pretty nine to five-ish. You know, it it changes a little bit if there's some big deadline, but we, you know, most people don't work on the weekends and people have families. And like I said, I have six kids. And um, one of the reasons that I love working at Murmur is I have huge flexibility having these kids. Um, Andrew, you know, clearly I've known him for nine years and we've been working together for a long time. But he knows that I have all these kids and occasionally they get sick or I need to go to a play or, you know, they need to come in and hang out for a couple hours. And, you know, it's it's all good. It's everyone is just um, very compassionate and understanding, but we all work really hard. And when we're at work, we're just kicking some butt. And then when we're done, we're all just really happy to work at such a great place. It ma- it makes such a huge difference, I think, also in uh, the output of your work, like the the quality of the creative and how you interact with clients and all those sorts of things. Oh, absolutely! And you know, that's one thing I'd say about Murmur too is we work with some really great brands. We love building brands. We we love building relationships with brands. And so, when I'm you know pitching a client. Now, I've done research about them, things like that. I am usually so excited about this client. Like I can barely contain myself because I'm so loyal. 
and I want to help them grow. And I know we have this amazing team of people that can actually make a difference and help grow their business. They just have to, you know, take that step and do their digital sign on Proposify. <laughs> 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 and, and then all of a sudden things are going to change for them. All their dreams will come true. But it's I heard, true. I heard uh, when I was listening to your podcast, which I will give a shout out to, and we'll put a link to in our show notes, the Creative Agency podcast. And I was listening to Andrew uh, talk about um, how Murmur started. And I love the... Um, the organic way it kind of went from freelancer to to full blown agency, yeah. um, but I heard uh, there that um, you're an amazing pitcher, which I can all I it doesn't come as a surprise just talking to you and hearing your enthusiasm for brands and working with clients, um, and that that's how you join Murmur is that. Andrew is doesn't like necessarily public speaking, and he knew you were a crackerjack at it. Yes, he's the yin to my yang. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he um, and and that story is, you know, he was still, you know, Murmur was doing well, but at that point, I think there were four people, and I've listened to almost all of your podcasts about the RFP debate. Um, and this was an RFP that came our way that Andrew, um, I wasn't working with Murmur officially at that time, even though I had my own consulting firm. So I was working with Andrew um, in that capacity. But this RFP came through and he was like, oh my gosh, this looks like a pain in the ass. I'm not going to do this. <laughs> and then they reached out to him and said, well, why didn't you respond to our RFP? And he's like, wow, okay, I guess I will if these people are that interested. So they called back and they said, congratulations, we have it narrowed down to three agencies. Uh, we'd like you to come in next week and present. So my phone rings and Andrew is, you know, incredibly talented designer, but he does not like public speaking. He's really good with just a couple of people and um, you know, a meeting or something. But when it comes to an official pitch with like 15 people in the room, it's just not his jam. But I thrive on it and I love it. And so he called me and he said, Mary, I can't believe it, but this really big, well-respected company called Melvin Mark um, in Portland wants us to come present. So will you do it for us? Will you do the pitch? And I'm like, are you kidding? Yes. <laughs> And so it was just a really fun experience. It was in a giant boardroom with glass from ceiling to floor. And it was kind of like, you know, we just felt we were so big time kind of going, <laughs> the, you know, the, the boardroom table sat like 20 huge leather chairs. And, you know, we just walked in there and the designers and developers just kind of had huge eyes. And I just had the biggest grin. I was like, these are my people. Like I can so do this. I just can't wait. And uh, we ended up getting the business. And that's when I, after that, I joined Murmur. And that's really when the growth started kicking in. Yeah, to, because to have somebody who can really pitch, that makes it that makes a huge difference, obviously. So, so being the queen of pitches, I guess we would call you. Uh -huh. um, what do you think? I know every client is a little bit different in every situation, but for you, what are some things that you think are common, like the, the top secrets to, to really putting a good pitch on and, and um, you know, that, that tipping point from just trying to sell your ideas in your agency? Yeah, you know, we, we're constantly refining our pitch and our presentation. Um, that's one thing is we're constantly talking about it. Um, but I think one of the biggest learnings uh, that I've had, um, as well as everyone at Murmur, is talking less about us and more about the client. Mm -hmm. talking, talking less about how amazing we are and great websites we do and focusing on, okay, what are your issues? This is how we can solve them. Um, and, and really personalizing a pitch. So I, I do a little bit of stalking. You know, I usually mm -hmm. really get to know someone before I pitch them. 
I mean, for example, in that Melvin Mark meeting, I had reached out to all the partners on LinkedIn and I had, you know, found out all different kinds of things to them. I found out one of them was retiring as the board um, chair of the Portland Development Commission. And I kind of congratulated on him on that, which completely took him off guard. <laughs> so kind of throwing in those things where you've done your homework, you know them, you know their business, you see their problems, and let's just talk about how we're going to solve them. Um, I'd say that that's one of the big things. And I think one of my advantages is I have such um, a long, in-depth marketing background that when I'm pitching, I'm constantly looking at their brand, you know, as a, a marketing project, and I'm a strategic thinker. And so I can kind of jump in with ideas and talk about different experiences I've had versus just giving a presentation. I'm kind of, you know, able to add value on the fly. Yeah, that that's a huge thing because I think rather than just being a, a billboard for the agency, I think being able to weigh in and relate to the business and the brand, and I and I would say um, your background working on the client side, I mean that's really got to come into play because you you've been on their side of the table in terms of working with agencies and what you need. I mean that that um, that experience must help you. Um, format your your presentations and what you're going to talk about and, and what's needed. It, it does. Um, and I, I feel incredibly grateful that I was able to be on the client side and transition to the agency side um, smoothly. I really loved being on the client side because um, I loved and I loved the relationship working with an agency. So like that was one of my really favorite things to do. So it's been interesting being on the agency side, but I definitely um, look at things like, okay, they're thinking, what's the ROI? How is this going to generate revenue? Um, and we're, as an agency, working on how do we demonstrate um, the return on investment of our projects that we've done for people? Because sometimes we, you know, we might just uh, do a logo. We we do a lot of of logos and build brand identities. It's a passion of ours, but it's not always easy to say how a logo actually increased your bottom line. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know, we're constantly trying to come up with ways to demonstrate the value of doing something. I mean, we know the value of a logo. You know, is the foundation of your company and. If it's weak, everything that you build on top of it is going to be weak as as well. So we know the philosophy and the importance of a good logo, but convincing someone who has a tight budget that this could you know be a huge game changer for them isn't always that easy when they're constantly just thinking about the bottom line. Yeah, I think our a lot of agencies, and I know when I worked with agencies, it was a struggle to prove that ROI because it, it's one thing if you're doing like PPC campaigns or something like that, mm-hmm. that's easy. But some of the other softer touch points like developing brand and messaging and those sorts of things, um, as you say, a lot of clients, they have some hard line expectations and results that they have to deliver and they want to know what that is. And sometimes it's really hard to um, to articulate what that what that ROI is going to be, even though you know in the long run, like this is going to help you, but kind of putting hard numbers around that is is challenging. Mary, in terms of that from client to agency side, because uh, what what other things do you think that maybe agencies are missing in terms of what a client is looking for, whether it's in the pitch or the relationship with the agency or or the work, because there's a lot of guesswork. I mean, when you're at an agency, you assume you, oh, we know clients and what they want. But really, um, unless you've worked on the other side, uh, you, you don't necessarily know all the ins and outs. Yeah, yeah, there. Um, that that's a good point. I think that... Um, Hmm. What you know, one thing, and and we're actually continuing to work on this ourselves, is you know constantly checking in with your client about you know their goals and objectives and where they are in their business. Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of times, you know, you kick off a project, and you know, then you have then it gets into project 
management mode where, you know, the project managers organizing, the designers are designing, the developers are coding, and you kind of get focused on the project. Um, and I think it's really important. And you might even, you, you're not always working with the person that you pitched. You might be working with someone who's managing the project on their end. So I think it's important for someone like me, the account director, um, to really make sure that I'm checking in with those people that I pitched throughout the project just to get a feel for how their business is going. And if, if they're, you know, if I see any opportunities, like if they tell me, oh, we're, you know, we're struggling in this area or our sales are down in this thing. Well, I might have an idea based on all the research that I've done on them and the project that we're doing that they might not have thought of. Um, so I think that that's just important, like not just checking in about the project, mm -hmm. but really checking in about the, the health and state of their business. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good point because I've had situations where sometimes something was going on with a client and they didn't tell us and it, it didn't occur to them because it wasn't necessarily directly related to the project we were working on. But then when we found out that they were struggling with this other issue, whether it was a downturn in their industry or a new competitor on the market that had really jumped in their differentiation, um, we had suggestions for it, but it was just really kind of keeping that line of communication open beyond just the, the, the daily moments of, of what was going on with the project. Yeah, that, that's a great example. And it's just being um, proactive because I think one of the worst things about being at an agency is when you feel like you have to be totally reactive all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so-and-so just called and, you know, wants the logo bigger or <laughs> you know, logo bigger in the middle, logo bigger. And, and, and you're constantly um, kind of reacting. Yeah. And that's, that's one other thing I, um, I'd like to say too, that that's a little bit different about murmur. And, you know, we all have those situations. Everyone does at, mm. you know, an agency where you have a client that is basically telling you how to design or, you know, how the website should be you know, be built or, you know, getting into kind of, you know, all of the details and you can, it can get really annoying and frustrating. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that I try to do, and it goes back to this loyalty that I have for our clients and I am fiercely loyal to Murmur's clients is when we have our staff meeting, I'll be like, all right, you know, how, how can we help them? Like, you know, let's not look at them as our nightmare because they're constantly, you know, tweaking things and, and it's annoying. Let's, you know, let's look at this in a, a different perspective. Like they have some good ideas. You know, how about if we add our ideas and come up with something amazing? So I, I'm kind of the little, you know, client cheerleader where, um, you know, when, when things might get annoying with a client, it's just good to have someone in there. Like, Hey, these are our people, yeah. you know, let's, let's like raise them up. Like they're, they're why we're able to work at this awesome agency in this cool space. And I mean, I'm even guilty of it where, you know, I'll have a client call and I'll be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has that, but. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that if you, but, but it's really important to, to keep it in perspective that these are your people. You know, they're, they're helping you grow and you're helping them grow. So sometimes people just, you know, need a little reminder of that occasionally. I think that's such a good point, and it's something I um, you know, dealt with agency side, and also even here at Proposed by sometimes it is hard. You get um, customer feedback and or just a nasty customer support email. And uh, I think it's easy for everybody to kind of jump on the, you know, light the fire and uh, want to burn everything in sight. Um, but you have to, you have to keep some perspective about it and also see it from the client side. They, yes. They're not trying to be jerks necessarily. No. I mean, there's the odd person who just tries to be a jerk but in general they're struggling with something so what's at the root of that struggle what what is it that we're doing on our side or how they don't understand something we haven't explained something we're not delivering what they need like 
yes, it can be annoying, but what is at the root of the real issue? And to your point, it all comes down to, and and not necessarily that you have to be, the the client is always right, but the client is paying, um, Uh the client's paying the bill. That doesn't mean they get to steamroll you with their jerkiness, but, um, but you know, that's what you're here to do is, is service clients. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, there's no room for any, you know, complete abusive people in in our world, but, um, that that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like a lot of times it's, they're, they're struggling. Like they just want their business to survive. This is their baby. They care. And so, you know, you're here to, to help them succeed and just stepping back and remembering that when you have those moments of frustration, well, let's face it, we can prevent that too uh, by finding the right clients in the agency world. Like, yes. If you find the right clients, then a lot of that's not even going to happen. And, and there's been times with the Proposify where I'm just saying, you know, this just isn't the right solution for you. And I'll send them to maybe a competitor that does something a bit different, maybe, or, or maybe they need a different solution, you know. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes, well, not often, but that can also happen. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've been in some pitch meetings. This just happened uh, a few weeks ago where I was in a pitch meeting with a new client and everyone was out in the studio. We have a big open studio with no walls. And uh, I walked out of the meeting, said goodbye to the client. And I just sat down at my desk and it was very quiet and everyone was staring at me. And I looked up and I'm like, what? And they said, what is up? Like you normally come out of that room just so excited and pumped. Like you just can't even believe how amazing this person was. And I said, you know what? That guy just was not my cup of tea. You know, I just don't think he's, Mm -hmm. you know, that company is going to be a good client for Murmur. And and a lot of that is just vibe stuff in a pitch Mm -hmm. meeting. You know, and so we kind of talked about it. And, and in those cases, there's things you can do. You know, you can make your proposal a little bit higher than you normally <laughs> would or things like that. If you just don't think it's going to be a good fit, if you get that feeling that early on, yeah. I'm one for kind of trusting those feelings. Big time. Big time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Listening to your gut there. I mean, we all need to do business, but uh, it's just going to go a bad way if you don't um, see where you're going to be able to work together well. Like I, I think Kyle once said, if, if you can't imagine yourself having a beer uh, with the client, then maybe or a coffee or whatever, um, yeah. maybe they're maybe they're not a, a, a good fit. It doesn't mean necessarily you have to be best friends, but if you, you can't even imagine sitting for an hour and chatting with them casually, mm-hmm. it's probably things aren't going to go very well, regardless of your level of expertise and what their need is. Yeah, that's that's a really good way to think about it. We can we can coin that the beer test. <laughs> the beer test. Why does it always boil down to beer? Yeah, that, that's a, that, that, that's the next agency's onboarding. That can be your onboarding. Is uh, <laughs> you have to have a beer with Mary. And, yes, and uh, and then and then we'll and then we'll talk about numbers. That could be a there. podcast, a beer with Mary. <laughs> Perfect. What's funny is uh, those times I've been in those situations where you decide to outprice a proposal or, or do something to, to kind of, okay, I, I don't think this is a good client. And inevitably they're like, no, we want to work with you. <laughs> and they come back or like to Kevin's point, we've had some customers here at Proposify where we've said, you know, I don't know that we're the right fit for you. And cause they've been really rude or something. And they'll, they'll come back with their tail between their legs and be like, no, we're <laughs> sorry, please keep, you know, let us stay. And we're like, Oh my God, we, we can't get rid of anybody. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. That's great. Well, and then it's uh, you're starting off on a new foot. You've kind of been through that struggle together. Yeah. You've cleared the, the air a little bit. So yeah. Um, in terms of clients, too, it's interesting because you worked for the the, the um, some of the clients you worked for on client side, like you mentioned cores, and I think you said uh, celestial seasonings, uh, tea. Those are large clients, obviously, and that that contrasts quite a bit with the kind of clients you work now um, with at Murmur, right? I mean, yes. what, what, what things have you noticed about that? that, I mean, there are similarities, a client is a client, but there's gotta be some big differences there as well. 
Yeah, well, the single big difference is uh, the budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just say as yeah. a, a marketing person at Coors, um, I really could do just about anything that I could dream up um, mm-hmm. in a marketing perspective, which was which was really great. Um, Celestial Seasonings wasn't nearly as big as Coors, but definitely a, a big national brand. Um, and what was really fun about them is they had such a loyal following of people. I mean, people really got into their, they had beautiful tea packaging with oh, quotes the on the tea bags. I love the quotes. The yeah, quotes are awesome. Quotes. Well, and I actually got to be on the quote committee when I worked oh, at Celestial. Oh, <laughs> and I got to, you know, each week we would submit like five to 10 quotes and then we would all go around and discuss the quotes and then we would pick one and, it was really, really fun. I'm a big Emerson and Thoreau fan, so I always loved a lot of those quotes. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. I threw in a couple of good John Lennon ones. I'm proud oh, of. Oh, perfect. Well, I, I, it's so funny because, uh, you know, when I, when I was a kid growing up, I didn't know that this kind of agency world, I don't know where I thought things came from, but uh, I didn't know this stuff existed and I was a copywriter when I became a copywriter I was just like wow that's how all this stuff happened you know how these taglines were written and I just thought it was super cool and I guess I never thought about there being a quote committee <laughs> since <laughs> yeah. Celestial Seasonings which I feel like Celestial Seasonings got me through my university degree well this, so. this sucks because now she's going to put a resume out I, looking for to be on a quote committee <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> well, well, because the other job I want to apply for is the person who makes up the name of um, colors. That's that. That's the other oh. dream job that, that I would love to have. You know, whether it's paint or yeah or, or whatever, I, I I would love to to do that. Don't worry, I'm not I'm not going yet. I, okay, I, I got to build up my color name portfolio a little bit more. Okay. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry. Go ahead. You were yeah. Talking so about, I, yeah. I, of course, you know, a budgets is a big thing, but the but as I was saying. Celestial Seasoning had such this loyal following who, you know, their tea, like you were saying, it got you through something in your life. Like Mm -hmm. it really meant something to you. Um, And it was, I loved that. I I just loved when people celebrate, you know, a product that they love in their life that means a lot to them. So, and one of the difference working with smaller clients um, is that there's so much potential to make change like quickly to yeah. make a big impact on a client very quickly. And a lot of times, you know, there aren't nearly as many stakeholders and the whole system isn't as big. They, they might not have a big distribution system. They don't have to go through brokers. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have to deal with any of that. You, you have a small client and you make a suggestion and they're like, let's do it. You know, two weeks later, it's being rolled out. Um, so I, I love how, you know, nimble you're able to be with smaller clients. Um, but we do also have some, you know, bigger clients. We have the, uh, American lamb, which is the national lamb board and they're based in Denver, Colorado. Um, they're a great organization. Um, so, you know, we do have some, some bigger ones that do get to do, you know, have a little bit more budget to do some great infographics and videos and, you know, things that we love to do, but we don't always get to do with smaller clients because they don't always have the budget. It's nice to have a range of clients, though, that way, then, you you know, you get to enjoy the, the benefits of the, the big client. And then, you know, to your point, the sort of the nimbleness of the smaller clients and being able to see um, the impact of your work faster. Because I've noticed that working with, with some small clients, some people would be like, oh, that sounds like a boring client. I'm like, no, no, we really got to see the, the fruits of our labor right away. Oh, yeah. And and that's that's another thing. Um that I love about our agency in particular. And I know you guys have had a lot of podcasts about, you know, specializing in a a certain industry. Um, You know, we specialize in the type of services that we offer, but we don't spec, we don't focus on only one industry um, because I'd say the, the one common denominator of everyone at murmur is we are all innately curious and I love learning about a new industry. Mm-hmm. It's what it's what fuels me. I mean, I love learning. 
why I loved graduate school. It's like, just, you know, give me as, as much information as, as you can so I can learn. And, um, you know, same thing with our designers or developers, like they'll, they get just as excited about a new industry or, you know, new challenges or opportunities as I do. They just are a little bit quieter about it. Um, but we all really enjoy working with new industries. It, it kind of fuels our creativity versus only doing, let's say the travel industry. And I know there's, you know, tons of benefits to being laser focused like that, but we love variety. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it just fuels our creativity. Well, and that having that um, culture of enthusiasm at your agency, that's a huge benefit to uh, to the client because uh, it's not like the same old, same old stuff. And they're they're just wheeling out the the, the sausage machine to roll out another campaign. I mean, having a, an agency that it's that is excited to work with you and excited about your industry and to learn about it. Um, that that's a that's a huge thing. And that's a differentiator as far as mm-hmm. I'm concerned. Yeah, we we had um, a client. I we were meeting with a new client, and I said, uh, he said, "Well, have you ever done any, um, you know, work in in our industry?" And I said, "Well, actually, no, we haven't." And he goes, "Good." He mm-hmm. goes, "I yeah. think that's great. I want fresh eyes, fresh perspective." That was like a major selling point for me. And I was like, we're going to be a good team because we (laughs) want to learn everything we can. And this is going to be great. Um, Well, and and we're going to wrap up here in a second. But I was just going to mention your other differentiator is Fernando. Oh, yes. Fernando. (laughs) Fernando. I so I'll let Mary introduce Fernando, but he's the Murmur Creative Office dog, from what I can tell. Yes, he is our studio pup. Um, and he is absolutely adorable. You can go to murmurcreative.com and go to the team page. He has um, his own Instagram, which yes. I follow now. Called, it's, uh, his account is That's So Fernando. And I just realized that he has 30 more followers than I do. Oh. <laughs> oh. Now I feel like I'm going to compete with Fernando for Instagram followers. Oh, he's and it's, it. and it's that's and then underscore so underscore Fernando. I want I want to help him build his following. Yeah, he's super. <laughs> he's super cute, and he looks like he sits on everybody's lap at the office. He does, and one of the best things that he does is we're sitting in a meeting. It could be a client meeting, and he'll be on someone's lap, and he puts his head on the table. And next thing you know, you just hear snoring. <laughs> Like in the middle of the meeting. So, so much for your pitch being interesting. (laughs) Yeah. And he let, I mean, he dresses up in different (laughs) outfits and he is just, he's, he's a great addition to the Murmur team. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, we're going to have to wrap it up here, but uh, maybe finish off with uh, where do you see Murmur going from this point um, in the future and and for yourself? Hmm. Well, um, I hope to be at Murmur a long time because I just love it so much and I love everyone that works there. And I think we are, we are definitely poised uh, to continue our growth. Um, And, you know, Andrew, Chris and I, um, we're kind of the the management team there. We talk a lot about growth and kind of where we want to go and um, we definitely want to grow. We want to be able to keep doing great creative work for clients um, but I think that we don't necessarily have a number of people or um, anything like that. I think our overall goal is our current team is so great. We want to just be able to pay people more and you know to offer <laughs> people great benefits. Um, nice. That's kind of our goal is to make the lives of everyone working at Murmur even better versus growing into some huge agency and and maintaining maintaining that work life balance for everybody. Um and just, you know, all, we're always keeping that in mind with our growth and if we feel like we're going to cut into that too much anyway, then we're not going to do it because our, you know, it's the people that really makes murmur um who we are and, you know, that produces such good work. So we just got to always make sure that we're taking really good care of our people. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's you've you've got your eye on the right prize I with agree. that kind of with that kind of focus. So, um, well, Mary, thank you so much for talking with us and sharing your enthusiasm uh, in general and for Propose Pie. Um, oh yes, <laughs> I'm your super fan, and you, you have me now for life. So well, we we love it. Thank you. We kind of feel that way about our our customers when uh, we love getting to know our customers, and and then we're always interested in watching them. I mean, I I watch what they do they're doing on social media and stuff, and I'm, I I love it. So. It's great. And um, if you do end up uh, coming to, uh, people should check out um, uh, cbiftrumpwins.com because we were talking with Mary about this earlier. Cape Breton is an island here in Nova Scotia that is offering refuge to Americans if Trump wins. And uh, Mary, <laughs> not that we're politically <laughs> saying anything, but we're, keep, but it, we're we're neutral. Saying, keep if, it neutral. If, if such a thing should ever happen under this sun. Uh, Cape Breton is a beautiful place and uh, you should come visit anyway. But if you go to the website, cbiftrumpwins.com, uh, you can get all the details. And ma- but Mary, you should come visit anyway. It, it's oh, I, I definitely want to. And I thought that that campaign was absolutely <laughs> genius. I hope I don't have to pack my bags or I hope they don't have a huge influx of people moving there. But uh, I thought it was genius, and I definitely want to come visit you guys because I just have enjoyed myself so much, and this beer is so tasty. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thanks so much, Mary. Right. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Take All right, care. bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there's something about Mary, wouldn't you say? Wow. Good yeah. cliche. Yeah, the Murmur Creative is lucky to have her. I'm Big sure time. the rest of the team is awesome, but uh, Mary's got something special and it's not just because she drinks beer at nine o'clock in the morning after exercising and getting six kids up and out the door unbelievable now that was one of my favorite interviews so far it was a really good one and i think it was probably awesome because kyle wasn't here (laughs) (laughs) poor kyle he's in bed right now sick (laughs) and you know what else is awesome nobody talked about farts on this episode that's true that's true as as brand manager of proposify i am against (laughs) Fart talking. So. Okay. <laughs> so no more. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> uh, as we talked about with Mary, you just have to email us and ask us to be a guest on this podcast, and we would love to have you. So please email us, review us on iTunes, send us your comments, ask us questions. We're here to answer. We'd love to interview you, especially more women. We love men, but we need some more ladies up in her Mm -hmm. so um, email us and uh, we look forward to chatting with you next week and Kyle will probably um, we'll let him come back to the company and Mm. take over his role here sounds good later but there's something about Mary that they don't know Mary there's just something about Mary Mary